Members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for the Economy, and we will start with listed questions. I call Mr John O'Dowd. Uh, question number one. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I met with Mr. Michael Hanley, the Chief Executive of Lakeland Dairies, in the immediate aftermath of the announcement regarding the Bambridge plant. Mr. Speaker, in June 2014, Invest and I offered Armagh Down Creameries financial assistance of £750,000 in support of a £15.6 million capital investment project, primarily involving the installation of equipment to enable the heat treatment of milk powder, the manufacture of products featuring low spores, and extending the shelf life of its product portfolio. To date, only £70,000 of the offer has been drawn down. In August 2015, it was announced that Lakeland Dairies and Fane Valley Group were in discussions to create a dairy joint venture with a view to enhancing economies of scale, improving efficiencies and helping to underpin milk prices for dairy farmers. Following this announcement, Invest and I had an extensive communication with Fane Valley regarding the implementation of the investment and about amending the offer to allow the new proposed joint venture company to avail of its support. An amendment to the offer was issued to Fane Valley in March 2016, allowing them to draw down the offer upon completion of the joint venture. In May 2016, Invest NI became aware that the proposed joint venture had become a sale with Lakeland Dairies acquiring Armagh Down Creameries and the milk pool outright. I and my officials in Invest NI, as I've mentioned, have met with Lakeland Dairies and offered to novate the letter of support on several occasions since then. In August, Lakeland Dairies announced a 30-day consultation to cease production in the winter months um, uh, the remain, uh, since the uh, announcement of the consultation period, employment service within my department have actively engaged with Armagh Down Creameries, uh, and out of the 70 employees, 57 have taken voluntary redundancy, and three are currently being redeployed within the group. Call Mr. Dowd for a supplement. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer and confirmation that there has been assistance offered both to the previous owners and to the current owners in relation to investment from Invest NI to secure the future of this plant. Is the Minister aware that there is speculation in the community now that this plant is closed, that the seasonal operation uh, will not reopen uh, in the springtime of 2017? And will the Minister ask Invest NI to redouble their efforts with the, the current owners of the plant to ensure that every option for investment in that plant has been um, investigated and that the plant, or the plant owners are fully aware that investment is on the table for them? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for, for his question, and uh, he's right to, to point out and draw out, and that's what I sought to do in my original answer, that we have uh, made offers of support, and, and, and I think it was uh, it's lengthy, there's been a history of making offers and re-making those offers of, of support. In fact, uh, in the meeting that I had with Mr. Hanley immediately after the, the announcement, uh, I made it clear that, whilst looking into the history of that issue personally, I also made it clear to him directly uh, face to face that we would be prepared to look at that offer again, do whatever was required, perhaps even enhance that support if it would secure the employment at the uh, Bambridge plant. Um, that wasn't met with a favourable response on that occasion, uh, not least because I think the scale of investment required in the plant uh, far exceeds uh, what the group is prepared to engage in at this moment in time. Uh, in terms of what the member said, in terms of rumours or talk within the local area, it's not something that I have heard, and it's certainly not what I heard directly from, from the company. Um, and there are 10 um, employees have been retained. My understanding is that 10 employees have been retained on site as a sort of skeleton staff to keep the, um, keep the plant ticking over, over the uh, winter period before seasonal work would come back in uh, next year. That's what I was informed. That's what I've told. I think the fact that 10 staff have been retained at least point positively in that direction. Uh, and clearly, we will continue to engage both at uh, my level and, and, and obviously at official level. Uh, with Lake Down Dairies to ensure that uh, what they say they're going to do, they do. And indeed, if there is any further support that they want to avail of, that we will we'll meet that with a, uh, a positive response in terms of engaging with them to see if there's anything that we can do. Well, Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, you will be aware that I wrote to you in August on behalf of Bambridge employees, many with over 20 years' experience, service to, uh, to the company, who were concerned about their future and for their families. So, does the Minister share my condemnation of a company from the Republic of Ireland purchasing this creamery to great fanfare in May, only to close it in September? And what steps will he take to avoid future piracy within the dairy industry? That's very, very strong terms from, from the member, and she's, she's of course uh, free to use those terms if, if she wants. Look, I, I'm not going to get into the business of, of condemning any, any business. As concerned as I am, and, and that's why 
I, I did get involved in, in the issue immediately upon hearing of, of the news. Um, and I have concerns, of, um, concerns about uh, how this has worked out and developed over recent months, uh, but I did want to get involved directly in it and, and make that offer to uh, the company that there would be support. The support that was on the books was still there and indeed made an, um, uh, said that we would look at further support if that was something that the, the company wanted to avail of. Like, I, I'm not going to get into the business of condemning any company for decisions that they, they make. Um, you know, I think unless we are in their position and look at the fullness of the, uh, the situation that they face, it's very, very, very easy for us perhaps to sit here and condemn them, but maybe not understand exactly the, the entirety of what they have to deal with. Like, my job is to try to, uh, first of all, work with the uh, now former employees to try to make sure that they have all the support that they require. Uh, but also to try to work with the company and indeed other companies to ensure that an agri-food sector which has been buoyant in Northern Ireland continues to flourish. Call Mrs. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers and thank the Minister for his very keen interest in this matter. Uh, I brought it to his attention when obviously it, the news broke uh, and I really do appreciate him coming down to the constituency and meeting with the organisation. Uh, on the back of that, can I ask what steps is the department's employment services taking to assist the employees in Banbridge to find or prepare for new employment? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I th thank the member for, for a question. Can I, can I uh, put on record praise for her for being uh, quick off the mark and, and inviting me down to her constituency to meet with uh, management from Lakeland Dairies um, and to uh, and we did that, I think, a couple of days after the news, news first broke. Uh, and members there and, and can testify that all sorts of offers of support and assistance were, were made to the company, uh, and those remain on the, very much uh, on the books. Um, my, my first priority is not to condemn the company, but to ensure that the staff working on the Bambridge plant uh, get all the support that they require in, in what is a very, very difficult time for them. So, Almost immediately, the uh, employment services, career service within my department engaged with the, the staff um, at the Banbridge plant, uh, held a number of clinics to provide advice and support. Uh, and that advice and support, Mr. Speaker, was around how to uh, job seeking and interview techniques and CD, CV development and, and, and the sort of things that you would expect, as well as providing information packs to guide them through a very, very difficult time for them. As I mentioned before, in response to Mr. O Mr. O'Dowd, 57. Uh, staff have taken voluntary redundancy, three have been redeployed within the group, um, and, and ten, as I mentioned, have been retained as a skeleton staff to, to maintain the factory. I also understand that some of those who have been made, uh, taken voluntary redundancy, have found employment elsewhere, particularly within the agri-food sector in the locality, and that we will continue to work with those staff and all of the support that is available is available to them on an ongoing basis to ensure that they can get back into the, the world of work as quickly as possible. Members, I must inform the House that question number two has been withdrawn and question number nine has been withdrawn, uh, both within the limits uh, agreed. Call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, question three, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since 2006, Tourism Northern Ireland has been working with the Grand Orange Lodge of, of Ireland to help maximise the tourism potential of the flagship 12 parades. Tourism NI has worked in partnership with the flagship parades to provide tailored world host training. This training was specifically designed to facilitate engagement between marching bands and visitors. The aim was to equip parade participants with local product knowledge to enable them to maximise the tourism opportunity arising from local parades. This year, the Royal Black Institution's 13th of July event at Scarva received support through the National Tourism Event Sponsorship Scheme and also leveraged further funding through the Northern Ireland Year of Food and Drink Tourism Events Scheme. This event, as well as 12th of July celebrations and Orange Fest, were promoted on the Tourism Northern Ireland website, discovernorthernireland.com. Research tells us that international visitors are interested in our heritage and our culture. Potential visitors to Northern Ireland are already looking for information to inform their travel decisions for 2017. It is therefore important that marching bands are integrated into the local tourism offer, making sure that they are included in what's on and events guide so that they can become part of a valuable, uh, valuable part of the overall tourism experience. Funding is available through the Tourism NI Events Fund, which is currently open for applications. And I would encourage any marching bands who are interested in showcasing themselves to a tourism market to apply to this fund, providing they meet the criteria. I call Mr. Anderson for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his answer. And Minister, you have referred to, to Scarver and uh, uh, you're well familiar with, with that particular uh, demonstration and event. 
uh, which takes place annually uh, there each and every year, up to, up to within the tens of up to uh, 100,000 people with many bands participating uh, in that event. And building on this, can I ask you, Minister, what is your assessment of Scarborough's uh, tourism potential? Mr. Mr. Speaker, for, uh, um, I have to um, the May put on, on the record um, my sadness at the, the passing of, of Drew Nelson, um, which we learned of in the last 24 hours. And I, I think a lot of the a lot of the positive work being taken forward by the Orange Institution and the Loyal Orders owes a lot to to Drew, and um, particularly in terms of the development of the tourism potential of the institution and of our loyal orders. If it wasn't for Drew and his leadership, um, that wouldn't have happened, and we will miss um, and we will mourn his passing, and we will certainly miss his leadership uh, within the Orange Institution and the wider family of loyal orders. Uh, to, to answer Mr. Anderson's question, I, I, I think there is there is huge potential for Scarva, which, which is a, a very very special event, um, and the member would be able to testify that it is a. Uh, it's an excellent day out. Um, it is one where you get the best of marching bands from right across Northern Ireland and indeed further afield come to Scarva on the 13th. You have the sham fight taking place in a lovely setting in, in, in what is a beautiful and nice village for that. And, and that, that's, that's measured then by the fact that in 2015 and again in 2016 this year, the visitor numbers to Scarva, one day, I mean, remember knows Scarva very well, it's a very, very small village, around 100,000 people visit Scarva on the 13th of of July. So it's, a, it's an event with huge numbers and therefore that brings with it huge potential and that's why Tourism and, uh, uh, NI has backed the event for the first time in, in the 2015-16 financial year to the tune of £20,000 and a further £15,000 this year uh, and that's why we were using as well to market the Northern Ireland Food of Drink um, through that as well. I, I want to see that potel potential develop further with infrastructure particularly around car parking and perhaps uh, seating for the event uh, as well as trying to attract tour buses and getting people to to Scarva for the day. It's a huge event, very successful already, and I, want, I look forward to working with uh, the Royal Black Institution to, to take it further. Well, Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's comments thus far and his uh, willingness to work with the uh, Department of Communities uh, in support of the marching bands and uh, tourism strategy. Um, would he further undertake uh, to ensure that the Ulster Scots Agency is suitably supported also to ensure this important area of our Northern Irish culture is fully recognised? I, I, I absolutely and I agree with the member and his, uh, his comments. And, and you're right, th th this is not entirely my department's responsibility or duty to uh, develop the tourism potential of either marching bands or the Ulster Scots uh, heritage and culture. It is, is something that spans a lot of departments. The member mentions the Department for Communities. And, uh, glad to see that the, the Minister for Communities has brought in, uh, re reintroduced the scheme to support the purchase of musical instruments by, by marching bands. I think that's around £200,000 a, a year. Um, but the members are about the need to work with the Ulster Scots Agency, and we have a very good relationship within the department and through Tourism and I, uh, and had some discussions already during my time in office about how we can expand that potential. And, and the member will be aware of, and I mentioned some of the areas in which support has been given through Tourism and I, but also support has been given to the, uh, the Belfast Tattoo, which is a hugely successful event, now something that's almost a, a fixed event on our, on our events calendar, uh, as well as various pipe band championships. And so I think some people maybe have a particular fixed view, unfortunately fixed view on marching bands, but the member and other members now will appreciate that that's much broader. Uh, and it is a, quite a, a broad and expansive culture, which uh, I'm very pleased that Tourism and I has continued to support and, want, and I want to see it do a lot more of that and develop it much further into the years ahead. Well, the Chair of the Economy Committee, Mr. Conor Murphy. I'm tempted to ask the Minister how he can minimise the impact of some of the uh, marching bands on our, on our tourism uh, product, but nonetheless, he will be at the moment, uh, I, I'm sure, putting together his uh, tourism strategy, uh, in which we hope to see a significant upturn uh, in the number of visitors and, and the input that tourism has to the local economy. Has he been able to put a, a cost uh, as yet as to what he considers a successful tourism strategy uh, will require in terms of that presentation to the executive. Uh, uh, on the member's first point, I'm sure the, the member um, certainly would agree with me that uh, we should be celebrating all of our, our, our culture in, in Northern Ireland and uh, people, people from outside of Northern Ireland are interested in our culture and that's why uh, we have through Tourism and I, and, I uh, and indeed through Tourism Ireland been trying to market that and promote that so that 
whatever people are interested in, from whatever part of the world they're in, whatever their, their own family backgrounds might be, that whatever they are interested in, there is something here, and it is developed, and it's professional, and it's world class, and there's something there for, for everyone. I'm sure the member would agree that we must do that, and that must also be part of any uh, tourism strategy, and the member's right that the department is in the process of developing a tourism strategy for Northern Ireland. Uh, I want that to be uh, an ambitious uh, tourism strategy for Northern Ireland. I think in the last number of years, We've seen significant growth in our tourism sector. We have reported in the last year the highest ever level of external visitors to Northern Ireland. I want to, to push on and build upon that, that recent success. But that will require some bold vision for tourism in Northern Ireland. I think we have some fantastic products already, Titanic and Giants Causeway and lots of other parts of our um, tourism infrastructure has been developing positively and has been attracting people in from around the world. But I think we need to be bold and imaginative around hotels and air links and how we can further develop our infrastructure. And it was great to see the Heaney Home Place opening last week, and that's just another thing that adds to that overall tourism product that we have. And the, mem the member is right to identify that that will come at, at some cost. Um, uh, I've been considering that cost with officials. haven't put a final figure on that yet, and obviously that will be dependent upon what resources are available there. But I think a sector which has been doing well, has been proven to be doing well, is one that the executive and indeed the assembly as a whole would want to support, uh, particularly if there is a bold and vicious, ambitious and future-looking, uh, future-forward-looking um, tourism strategy there, in which we can all follow. I call Mr. Stewart Dixon. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for, for your answer thus far. Um, and indeed, if if I can add not only to that the the um, tourist event that Scarva is, but also the orange pageant at Carrick Fergus Castle. But sadly, Minister, there's a very dark and sometimes a very negative side uh, to, to some bands uh, and indeed, sadly, to, to those organisations that march around the, the province of Northern Ireland. What actions are you going to take to try and deal with the negative image that many of these events uh, conjures up and indeed to, again, encourage you to support events like the Orange Pageant and Carrick Fergus and others, which send out a more positive signal? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the Orange Pageant in, in uh, Carrick Fergus is one that I'm very familiar with. I have attended it a couple of times over the last number of years. Um, it's a great day out, good family day out. Um, but I also attended particularly to see David Hilditch dressed up in, uh, in period costume. It's worth it. It is worth it, members, for, for that alone. I would encourage members on all sides to attend just to see David dressed as the, uh, as the mayor of Carrick Fergus, which of course he was uh, himself in recent times. King, King of Carrick Fergus, somebody says, I think that's probably a more, more appropriate title. Um, but it is a great event, and, and, and it is, I think, perhaps a member has encouraged this, or others have as well, that you know, sometimes they look at the, uh, the few and far between um, parts of our, um, on all sides of our culture, which sometimes hit the headlines for the wrong reasons. And the member will be aware that the, the loyal orders, the vast, 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 overwhelming majority of loyal order parades right throughout the year pass off peacefully and without any incident. Uh, and sometimes we forget that. And particularly around the 12th and the 13th, and indeed other uh, significant dates in our marching season, um, the events go off, and they are family events, uh, and they have been increasingly so over the last number of years. And that has been to do with the, the far-sighted vision and leadership of people like Drew, Drew Nelson. And I think we need to, and we owe it to him and to his legacy, to continue with that work in the next number of years. And I, and I, I admire, I have to say, I have, no, I have a musical note in my head, but I admire uh, the dedication of people within our marching bands who weekend after weekend after weekend and throughout the week uh, practice and then go out and display their, their talent and I think we uh, should acknowledge it as something where people are dedicated to and there's a, and a wonderful discipline that comes from that as well uh, and, and, and if there is a tourism benefit as I believe there is then we should seek to exploit that to the maximum. Call Mr George Robinson. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker our connectivity is an important driver for economic growth in Northern Ireland and, and provides access to key markets for investment exports and tourism. I am keen to support our airports to improve Northern Ireland's air connectivity, particularly where a route can provide be uh, benefits to the wider economy. For example, we have provided support to United Airlines to secure Northern Ireland's only transatlantic connection to the United States, and the Executive has announced a £7 million package to the North West to assist development and growth around City of Derry Airport. I am encouraged by the recent growth of 8 per cent in the number of passengers passing through Northern Ireland's airports in the year to March 2016. I look forward to seeing this trend continue in line with economic conditions and seeing increased air connectivity from Northern Ireland. I welcome recent positive developments in the sector, including the establishment of a Ryanair base at Belfast International, 
and the launch of a new connection to Brussels from Belfast City Airport. Belfast has also been successful in its bid to host Roots Europe conference in April of 2017. That's a major aviation conference that brings together decision makers from the airlines, airports and tourism authorities. Mr. Speaker, my officials are in regular contact with, contact with all of Northern Ireland's airports to support them in their route development endeavours. We are exploring all options to expand our, our access by developing strategic links to pr promote economic and tourism development in Northern Ireland. And I will consider any proposal for a route with business or inbound tourism potential which can benefit our economy. Mr. Robinson, first supplementary. Thank, thank the Minister, Mr. Speaker, for <clears throat> his answer. And did the Minister use the opportunity of his recent visit to the United Arab Emirates to seek to develop an air route from Northern Ireland to the Middle East? And I thank him for his mention of Eglinton as well. <laughs> thank you. It's a bit <laughs> uh, thank the member for his question. I, 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 I'm, I was pleased that the executive were able to come forward with a package of, of support for our city of Derry Airport, which I you know is an incredibly important gateway to, to the northwest. And I'm glad that we were able to support that. And, and I hope that um, whilst that airport has had some difficulties, I hope that that package might be able to um, attract a new airline or airlines to that, that airport. And, and uh, improve and enhance connectivity into the Northwest. Uh, and the short answer to the member's question about uh, whether I used the opportunity of my visit to the Middle East last week to, to promote uh, and seek to develop our connectivity to Northern Ireland is that I did. Um, um, it was an issue that came up, even without me wanting to push it, it was an issue that came up time and time and time again, particularly in conversation with uh, people from Northern Ireland who are doing business uh, in the Middle East. Um, they see the, the huge potential of exporting into that region, as we discussed in our debate around trade and exports yesterday. Um, and, and whilst there are other connections that they can take, they know that uh, having a, there's huge potential in terms of, of tourism. Uh, Middle East tourists are, are tend to be very, very high spenders and travel in large groups, um, but also in terms of business. So if you have that direct connection to the Middle East, um, then there's huge opportunities to grow your, your trade as a result of, of that. So I, I, I fully aware of the importance of our links, not just sometimes I think we look at it just from tourism outbound or inbound tourism, but it's hugely important uh, when you have those bigger, particularly bigger planes on, on routes to helps to boost your, your trade as well. So we made some very good, useful contacts when we were in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and of course both our homes to, to major airlines that continue to grow. Um, I want to make sure that we are talking to key decision makers within uh, those airlines over the coming months. I know that contact has been made in the past, but I want to, as I seek to expand further, that they are hearing from Northern Ireland, they're hearing from Belfast or from City of Derry even about the potential that there is for uh, Northern Ireland to, uh, obviously, uh, with tourism and, of course, trade. Call Mr. Mark Durkin. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. I'd also like to place on record my gratitude uh, for the executives. Uh, intervention and investment in the city of Derry Airport, but perhaps that the, the Minister could uh, inform the House if he or the Executive have any plans working in conjunction uh, with Derry City and Strabane District Council to encourage and increase use of city of Derry Airport. But obviously, I and the member will know better than me that there have been challenges facing that airport over um, the last number of years. and. Um, it was uh, regrettable to see Ryanair pulling out of the um, city of Derry, um, albeit that they have moved a lot of those operations to Belfast International, which will bolster uh, that airport. But clearly, we want to see connectivity maintained into the northwest. That's why the executive were yeah, innovative and bold in doing what we did and, and putting a package of support forward. Uh, a mixed package of support forward for the City of Derry Airport. And we want to work very closely with them and we want to work very closely with the Council. And there has been a lot of contact with the Council over the last number of weeks to try to attract in a, another airline or several airlines that can um, solidify and, and affirm that, that its position, the City of Derry Airport's position, and increase connectivity from, from that region. Um, and a, a member uses the word uh, our intervention, and, and, and I've come to a very quick and firm view over the last number of months that. You know, we need to, as an executive, whilst it's not our responsibility and these are private or uh, entities that are not in our ownership, we do need to be, as an executive, a little bit more interventionist, sometimes um, not heeding the advice of, of others in doing it. I think we need to be directly involved in trying to attract routes to Northern Ireland. Uh, it seems to be, in, in very short order in my experience, that if you're not, you're not going to win. Everybody else is getting directly involved, everybody else is intervening, and if Northern Ireland doesn't see its airports um, as strategic assets, 
uh, then we're not going to win, we're not going to succeed, and we're not going to increase connectivity, and we're not then going to get the benefits in terms of inbound tourism uh, or indeed in terms of trade that we would uh, hope to have and expect to have. Call the Deputy Chair of the Economy Committee, Steve Egan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much indeed for your comments so far. Uh, would the Minister like to see how our aviation sector can be appropriately incentivised, giving the suitable business cases? to encourage the establishment of additional air routes, particularly to North America, to Europe, and I welcome the news about the Middle East. I would also like the Minister, while he is doing this, to urgently, along with his executive colleagues, to investigate what many consider the unfair and uncompetitive practices now being adopted by the Dublin Airports Authority, and again, as supporting to increase our global air links, would he support the scrapping of air Ask passenger duty to to and question. improving road and rail, rail links? Thank you, Mr. I think I, I think I counted about three questions there, Mr. Oh. Mr. Speaker. Um, to, to try my best in the time available to me, to, um, Mr. Speaker, to, to answer this. Look, I, I think we have. Um, there is a perception again, perhaps, that we are not doing well in terms of attracting our routes. I think we always got to, to remember that this is a small region, population of 1.8 million. Um, it is going to be difficult to attract and to have the volume of traffic, whether that be in terms of tourism or in trade, to, to justify routes to all parts of the world. And that's why I think it's important that we are strategic, Mr. Speaker, in, in, in seeking routes to areas which are important. That's why, in response to, to Mr. Robinson's question, you know, I think the Middle East, as a gateway to that broader region and indeed into the Far East, is an incredibly important place that we should be working on. Uh, but we have attracted in recent times uh, routes to Brussels, to Amsterdam, direct flights to Brussels, Amsterdam. Uh, out of the city airport in Berlin and Milan in recent times out of the international airport. So there has been success, Mr. Speaker, in terms of attracting routes, particularly into key markets. And it was interesting whenever I was up at the international airport announcing the Berlin route or welcoming the Berlin route that, that there was as many people coming from Germany to Northern Ireland as going out to it. So it wasn't one of these routes where people were leaving Northern Ireland and spending their money there and coming back. It was one where there was two-way traffic. Um, those routes have been secured in, in spite of the issue of our passenger duty. Uh, and our passenger duty has obviously been waived at a cost to the executive for long haul flights. And it's disappointing that, with the exception of a few charters, that hasn't yielded a, a permanent uh, long haul route over and above the United flight to, to New York. Uh, clearly, work continues to go on in targeting key routes into places like Canada and the Middle East, as I've, I've mentioned. Uh, and I will continue to do that, and we'll continue to have all conversations that I possibly can to try to attract our SR lines. Indeed, I've already had some. Um, I mean, I think APD should be scrapped. I think it works against uh, peripheral regions like Northern Ireland. I think it is a, a incumbent upon Her Majesty's Government uh, to do what it, in Northern Ireland what it has done with uh, the Highlands and Islands of Scotland and scrap it specifically for that. Uh, and I think that they should be taking the burden for doing that, having introduced it in the first place. Call Ms. Kiva and Archib. Um, and the Minister mentioned United Airlines routes in his, in his previous answer. Um, can I ask how his um, Department it has ensured value for money in terms of the executive contribution to ensuring the link between Belfast and the USA is sustained. Look, we were faced with a very difficult set of circumstances that the member will, will appreciate and understand uh, back in the summer with the threat of the imminent withdrawal of, of our only transatlantic flight, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I, I took a decision which was, was backed and supported by uh, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister and indeed by other members uh, within this House that it was too important to Northern Ireland uh, to let that go and to lose that, uh, and we obviously offered the, the support that we, we did. Uh, and I, 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 I took a, a very clear view very, very quickly that Northern Ireland needed to retain its only direct transatlantic route, but I also take the view, as I mentioned in response to the other members, that we need to work very, very hard at ensuring that that is not our only transatlantic route or it is not our only long haul, direct long haul route to, to key uh, and strategic markets. So work will continue. Uh, to develop other routes as well as trying to ensure that the United flight remains. Call Mr. Alistair for a quick question and a quick response from the Minister. Okay. Uh, has the Minister any concerns that the generosity of the Executive's multi million bailout of the New York route will leave us a hostage to similar expectations and pressure from other operators and future operators? Uh, the member, I'm, I'm sure the member may asked the question of not having wanted to lose the direct transatlantic flight to, to New York. Uh, and we were faced with, as I mentioned in the previous answer, a very difficult and challenging set of circumstances back in the summer. Uh, and we took the decision that we did. 
Um, and there was a, a broad team approach to taking that decision, both in terms of the private sector and across the political sector, to, to, to take that decision. And I think we believe that we did the right thing, and, and some may disagree with that, but I think it was fundamentally the right thing to do to maintain Northern Ireland's only direct transatlantic route. Uh, and look, I take a view that I am willing to work with any and all operators to develop routes from Northern Ireland, particularly to key strategic markets. Uh, and I want to be uh, a bit more directly involved, a bit more interventionist in doing that. Uh, it's clear to me that other regions do that. Uh, and if we want to increase and enhance our connectivity, which I am sure that everybody in all corners of the House would agree is a good thing for Northern Ireland, then we are going to have to be more directly involved in doing that. And, I, and I've already had some engagement with some airlines and with the, and indeed with all the airports. And I look forward to more engagement over the months, uh, weeks and months ahead. Uh, and hopefully that will bear fruit in terms of, of more uh, routes from Belfast and from City of Derry. Members, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. I call Mr. Mark Durkin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd uh, like to ask the Minister if he has had any discussions with his colleague, the Health Minister, and indeed uh, with the University, about the prospect of the establishment of a medical school in the North West. I, I haven't had any discussions in current position with uh, the ministers and colleagues that he, he mentions, although it is something that I'm familiar with from my time as um, health minister, and I'm seeking to draw my, my knowledge from that time. Look, I, I think there, is a, uh, there was a very good proposal in, in its infancy and early stages and requiring some significant amount of development made by the university to open a graduate medical school in the Northwest. And I, I think that um, that was a, a, a good and positive thing to address, particularly two factors. One was to, to, to address the issues with high locum costs. I've now sort of reverted very quickly back into my previous role as a member will notice. High locum costs in the Western Trust area and also an issue with uh, general practice, which we know was raised by Paula Bradley in the House yesterday. Um, and both were to deal with those particular issues which are, are more very pertinent in the Western Trust area. Uh, and look, I, um, I haven't had the discussions that the member has, but I expect that we will have discussions as the university develops its plans and ideas for our graduate medical school in the North West. Mr Durkin for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And, and, and I do recall in a previous role uh, words of support uh, for this proposal uh, from the Minister. I just wonder now then, could the Minister maybe, or would the Minister be in the, a position to give this Assembly an assurance of his commitment to making uh, this medical school become a reality? Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, I, 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 am, I will give the same um, uh, view now as I did when I was Health Minister, which is I you know, very much support in principle the idea of developing a graduate medical school in the Northwest. I think it, it made sense for health reasons, for a range of health reasons that I mentioned. And obviously that has to be done in, in connection with available finances and, and uh, all of the requisite business cases and so forth. But in principle, absolutely, it's something that I support. Uh, and I look forward to working with the university and the colleagues to, 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 to make it happen in the future. Well, Mr. Paul Garvin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Could the Minister give the House his thoughts on the recently published annual business and employment register and what it says for the manufacturing sector in Northern Ireland? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the, the member uh, mentions the annual business and employment register and specifically the, the issues around the manufacturing sector. And the manufacturing sector has been subject to debates, discussions, questions in this House over the last num number of months. Um, the survey and the register shows very good results for the manufacturing sector. And may I reiterate again, I wouldn't come to this House and dismiss for a, a single second issues such as the impact of the loss of jobs and 200, 200 250 jobs at Caterpillar which will affect the member's own constituency, or indeed Bombardier or some of the other uh, uh, well-publicised uh, job losses, particularly in the Balamina area. I wouldn't for a second say that they are unimportant. They are uh, serious and significant impact, particularly for the people affected. But as I have said in this House, and I have said uh, publicly as well, that um, it belies a, a positive trend within the overall manufacturing sector. Uh, and the register shows that point, it shows it quite, quite clearly. There was an overall increase in the number of jobs in Northern Ireland, some 7,750 uh, jobs, and that was between September of 2014 and September of 2015, uh, and that was a 1.1% increase. But particularly in the manufacturing sector, which is this sector that we're told is a uh, sunset sector, is on its way out, uh, there was an increase of 3,162 jobs, which is a 4.1% increase 
in manufacturing jobs over that uh, year period. Interestingly as well, the construction sector, again a sector that has struggled, it was up by over 4% as well. Look, this is, I, I think, notwithstanding the impact of job losses in Caterpillar and Bombardier and elsewhere, it's continued good news for Northern Ireland, especially in, in manufacturing. Interesting too to see that it is areas like Mid-Ulster uh, and in the west of the province, which has the highest percentage of manufacturing jobs in the whole of Northern Ireland, again belying an impression that many, many would have. Look, we've got to continue to work closely with our manufacturing sector to ensure that not only can we mitigate the impact of those job losses, but that we can actually continue to grow our sector in the way that we have been doing over the last number of years. Mr Garvin for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his answer. And uh, I, do, I do welcome uh, the positive news that we hear, irrespective of some of the negative large announcements that have been made recently. Uh, but what does the Register say about the wider uh, labour market in Northern Ireland? I, I think, the, I think the, the overall picture is, is a good one. Uh, it continues to, um, this is data from uh, September 14 to September 15, uh, and the fact that it's shown a 1.1% increase in overall employment levels, I think, is a, is a good thing and to be celebrated. Um, and it follows on from more recent data, which shows that the employment, uh, employment levels continue to rise and are at the highest levels since 2009. Um, I think one of the, the most interesting statistics that you can draw from, from the register this year is the, the, the public private sector balance, or, or rather rebalancing, and the member will be very familiar as a member of the Finance Committee that you know, the, the executive has been focused in the last number of years on rebalancing our economy. Uh, and, and it's good to see in the register that there was, a, over the year, a decrease in public sector employment by 2.6% and a commensurate increase in private sector employment of also of 2.6%. But the, in, the net increase was approximately 8,000 more jobs in the private sector rather than in the public sector. And that's good news. And I think that, that shows that the executive's policy of, of rebalancing the economy is working. Look, I, I can remember that it's in the news today with the report on the voluntary exit scheme. Uh, and I can remember, I was a member will know that I was involved in that as finance minister. I was uh, helped to develop that and helped to implement that policy. Um, it was new, it was novel, it was innovative. Um, and there are a lot of people in this house and in the media who want us to be bold and innovative, but then whenever we are bold and innovative, want to talk it down. And, and this is a policy that worked. And I can remember sitting in TV studios being told, what, what will you do when this doesn't work? What will you do when enough people don't come forward? And here we are now with an uh, uh, audit office report coming forward saying that this has been a success and it has worked. And we will have to continue to be bold and to be brave in the public sector over the next number of years in government. Uh, and I will certainly do that, and, and I know that our executive colleagues will continue to be innovative in dealing with the many challenges that we face. Called Mr. Declan Kearney. Minister, could you outline what safeguards are in place to protect the, the rights and conditions of workers uh, who are employed by private companies such as Concentrix? Uh, when they attract multi-million pound contracts and grants from our own job creation agencies in order to secure public sector contracts? Yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm obviously aware of the particular issues that there have been with Concentrics. Obviously, Concentrics are a, um, have been successful in terms of growing its company in Northern Ireland over the last number of years. Um, it's putting down roots in Belfast through the redevelopment of the, the Maysfield site. And, and uh, I certainly want to encourage that company to continue to grow. Obviously, as a face of particular issues, the member uh, knows from the uh, issues around tax credits and uh, payments. I've been in contact with uh, the company on its head here in Northern Ireland, and uh, they have been following uh, the instructions given to them by HMRC and are unfortunate victims of, I think, I believe, of uh, the fallout of some political criticism of the contract. That doesn't take away from the impact that it has on, on, on individuals and. I certainly dealt with them in my constituency, and I'm sure the member has dealt with them as well. In terms of particular issues, in terms of uh, that the member raises in respect of safeguards, uh, I will take that issue away and I'll write back to the member with I don't want to give him a, a half hearted or indeed a, a wrong answer here, and I would rather give him a, a comprehensive and full answer uh, in respect of the issues that he has raised. Mr. Kearney, for a supplementary. Well, I would appreciate that feedback, Minister, and thank you for that. It is, in fact, as you know, a matter of very serious uh, public interest. Staying in, in that vein, uh, would you, Minister, support the call from the Public and Commercial Services Union for an official inquiry into the established failings of the contract that you mentioned between HMRC and Concentrics? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I think it's, a, it's very much a matter for 
uh, HMRC and um, their standalone department, I think, in terms of governance within uh, the United Kingdom government uh, to decide what they want to do. And I think they are doing various inquiries and, and inspections into the, the overall contract. Look, I, 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 I know Concentrix, I know the company, I know that, in fact, I think his, his party colleague, the uh, finance minister, attended the sort of official launch of the new development down at Maysfield. Uh, it is a company that has gone from strength to strength in Northern Ireland. I want to see it continue to go from strength to strength in Northern Ireland. Obviously, it has had an issue and has borne the brunt of that issue in terms of the HMRC and tax credit contract. Uh, I want to see it come through that. I want to work with the company to ensure that it comes through that. Uh, and I want to see it continue to put down those farm routes in Northern Ireland and grow its employment here. I call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister will be aware that community classes offered in church halls, orange halls and community halls by our six local further and higher education colleges are a lifeline to many living and working in isolated rural areas. So can I ask the Minister what support is, being proving to, and is, is he doing to providing to increase this provision? I, I agree entirely with the member in terms of the the, the very, very important role that uh, community uh, providers uh, give in terms of, of, of learning and, and skills development within our community. And, and I, I, I saw this quite uh, early on in my term. I visited the Shangle Women's Centre uh, on the invitation of uh, Diane Dodds and William Humphrey. And I saw for myself uh, the fantastic work that they were doing there and, and how it was. And, and what, what struck me, Mr. Speaker, was the stories that participants in, in a range of courses gave me. And, and these were people who maybe hadn't had the best experience in terms of formal education, uh, had felt that they were pushed outside of the system, found it difficult to come back. And it was a big step for them to go back into any sort of form of education. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, they, 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 what shone through for me was particularly one story from uh, a young lady who had a family of four but had gone back and you know, started to, after very few qualifications, started to pick up more qualifications and was now applying to go to Queen's to study midwifery. Uh, and you know, that's that sort of story that I don't think we hear enough of in terms of community-based education. It's an area that I, I, I want to, after having seen it firsthand uh, in the Shankill Women's Centre, it's an area that I want to, to support uh, through the department. I'm aware, as a member mentions, that colleges do provide services through um, in, in the various settings that she has mentioned. I want to see more of that happen. I don't think enough of that happens. And I don't think that we have um, perhaps been as supportive of those community-based educators in recent times as perhaps we could have been. Mrs Dobson, for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer? And given that without these courses, many would be unlikely, as he said, to enrol on campus-based education courses, does the Minister appreciate the stepping stone effect which community education can give to further study? And can I ask him what help um, he is providing colleges to measure the impact of those community courses to better target provision for rural areas? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I write to the, the member specifically about the, the levels of support and then the impact and positive benefit that that has produced, and I'm sure it will be positive benefit that it has produced. And, and sometimes, though, I accept that in, in measuring it, it doesn't always show up that easily in a lot of the, the measurements that we use. But I think the real benefit is in exactly what the member and myself have been talking about: where hard to reach in hard to reach hard to reach people in hard to reach communities are able to take with confidence and in their own community setting and with their peers the first step back into education. Actually, it is a first step, and, it, and it, they can't do all of their education. If they want to go to a certain level, or particularly in the degree level, they can't do all of it in a community setting, but it certainly breaks the ice for them to be able to do some of their early, qualifica early stage qualification in a community setting. I want to see more of that happen. I want to encourage that to be the case, and I want to use all available funding measures that we have at our disposal to ensure that there is more going on in a community setting than is, is currently the case. Call Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, I have a business in my constituency who has experienced regular outages and making very little progress with NAE on this here. Would you raise my case with NAE for me? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy for the, the member to, um, if he writes to me with the details of the case, I uh, appreciate why we want to go into the detail in the House, but if he writes to me in detail, I will certainly take it up with, with, with NIE on, on his behalf and, on, more importantly, on his constituents' behalf. Um, 
the member asked me, I think, a couple of weeks ago about, about BT and he's raised the issue of NIE and uh, the member knows that, that, that both are, are regulated industries and there's limited, uh, they're not accountable directly to me, it's not my responsibility. But even though I'm not responsibility, I don't have responsibility, I hear a lot about it through members like himself and indeed through direct correspondence from, from businesses. I'm particularly hearing at this minute in time from, from landowners in different parts of Northern Ireland, particularly around County Tyrone. Uh, who are experiencing some difficulties with NIE working or wanting to work on their land. And uh, Mr. Buchanan um, took the opportunity when he, when he had me in the west of the province, when he had me in Oma, to take me to some landowners who were experiencing some difficulties uh, with NIE. And not objections to what was being done, Mr. Speaker, but the manner in which it was being done. Um, and I'm meeting with NIE this week, and I want to raise some cases that Mr. Buchanan and indeed other members in the House have raised with me. I'm happy to raise the, the member's issue as well if he brings it to, uh, to my attention in more detail. A quick supplementary and a quick response. Thanks, to, uh, Speaker. Minister, can you update the House on, this pla on your plans to ensure energy security for Northern Ireland in the future? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I think energy, as I look at all of the, the issues of facing the economy in Northern Ireland, there are many, and there are, there are many challenges facing Northern Ireland and our business community. I think perhaps the biggest is, is the issue of, of energy. Uh, and not just in terms of the price of energy, particularly for, for higher energy users, but in terms of security of supply. Uh, it affects our competitiveness and particularly affecting our, our manufacturing business and businesses. And I don't want to um, be alarmist and start talking about the lights going out or anything like that, but I do have concerns about uh, future generation capacity in Northern Ireland. I, I think that we have to have, Mr. Speaker, a big, open, honest conversation about future energy policy in Northern Ireland that has to touch on grid infrastructure, it has to touch on generation capacity. It has to touch on interconnection and storage and future renewables policy as well. And all wrapped in the envelope, to, to answer the member behind me, so it's all wrapped in the envelope of what we can do to make it as affordable as possible, particularly for, for big energy users in Northern Ireland. Uh, and there are some potentially tough decisions within all of that, but I think we have to have that big, open, honest conversation about future energy policy. And it's something that I want to kickstart in, uh, in the not too distant future. Time is up. Sorry.